anti-communists. And Churchill would say, if Hitler attacked hell, I'd ask the House of Commons for aid to give to the devil. And that's a pretty good way of saying the enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. Whatever it takes to win the war. And so they all begin to help Stalin or help the, uh, the Soviet Union. But back to this. Stalin was furious that Soviet blood was being shed. And he wanted them to attack here to come so the Germans will be basically squished two ways. Well, the Western allies weren't ready. That's why we had that video where they said they attacked North Africa first. And then eventually they would decide to go into Sicily and Italy. Mussolini's government would collapse, but Germany still held out Italy here for the rest of the war. It turned out to be a terrible place to fight. And they did not open a second front, for the most part. <coughs> but there was a version of the second front. Both the United States and the British began to heavily bomb Germany. And we call this type of bombing strategic bombing. Remember, tactical, short-term, one decision on the battle, strategic, long-term. And this is an element of total war. They begin to bomb major German cities and industrial areas. Remember I told you about, why do you want to take the war to the enemy's home? Knock out their industry. Knock out their fuel. Break their morale so they want to quit fighting and then tear. And this also would be revenge for the Blitz. Terrify German cities, German civilians. If they don't have supplies, if they don't have tanks, they can't fight. If they can't make ammunition, they can't fight. And so, these are some of the cities they begin to bomb from bases in England. The problem was, long-range heavy bombers are slow and not very maneuverable. The British lost a lot of bombers when they first tried this, so they bombed at a mouse night. The problem with night bombing is... You can't see what you're aiming at. That's a Halifax bomber, the British second best bomber. That's actually in daylight. Hard to get good pictures of them flying over German cities at night because of the whole darkness thing. But by the end of the war, the German defenders were they just bombed 24 hours a day. But area bombing means they would literally just stake out an area in the city and just hope their bombers at night could find that area and drop bombs in. These would be civilian errors. They kill as many people as possible, bring tear, and also they thought would hurt the factories or production. It had it was horrible on the crews. They lost some eighty six thousand casualties. British casualties alone under bomber crews. That's how deadly it was. Casualty, remember that's killed, wounded, or missing. The U.S. came later, obviously, but the United States Army Air Force they would bomb at day at daytime. And they thought they could do precision bombing. They thought they had better bomb sites. They'd bomb at 17,000 feet. It's really tough on the crew because it's frigid up there. These heavy bombers like this B-17 was rippling with 15 or 14 machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns. They thought if they're all flying together, these big groups, not only would the bombs all be in one spot, some of them hit the target if they're close, but keep away enemy fighters, it didn't work. They lost a lot of B-17s, 46,000. American bomber crew would be killed over Germany. It's actually unreal how many died. Because just don't think about it. You think about the land war, how many people died, and how many died over the strategic bombing. And it didn't work. German fighters really shot them out easy, much easier than they thought it was going to happen. In fact, it wouldn't be to an invention of a weapon. And this is one of the few weapons I do want to tell you about because it's probably one of the most decisive weapons in the history of warfare. The greatest fighter plane ever made. A British engine put in an American design, so really allied effort. Anybody know this plane that had enough range to fly from Britain, escort the bombers, and defend them over Germany and fly back? Greatest plane ever made. Yeah. Close. P 51. The P 51 Mustang, this sleek, pretty cool plane. A couple years ago, they had a air show, and a P 51 came in and they they jerry rigged it so they can put another person in, they can take flights in it. I really thought about it, but it's pretty pricey. And also, my wife said no. <laughs> Not for money. This might shock you, but she also said those things crash all the time. And that's when I found out she actually kind of likes me. That's kind of nice. But here we go. <laughs> they flew along with the bombers beginning in 1944, and two things have happened. First off, it actually didn't really do much to German industrial production. 
German industrial production kept rising all through 44. It actually did not destroy the factories the way they thought. It didn't quite work the way they thought, but it did one thing that was decisive. It destroyed the German Air Force. Notice I put a line through it. Get it? See? The Waffle line through it. Pretty creative, huh? Yeah. No one taught me to do that. I just knew to do that. Yeah, those planes just were better than anything the Germans could put up. The Germans actually had a chance to build a jet fighter that could have been decisive, but Hitler wanted it to become a fighter bomber, delayed by a year. Who knows how things would have been different. But knocked out the German Air Force. But the thing was, the bombing still didn't work. Even by the end of 44, they're bombing German cities pretty much at will. But going into 45, they're desperate to end the war. And remember Sherman's march to the sea? Now, I marched to see they turn into South Carolina. And I told you about how wars at the end sometimes get the bloodiest they ever do in an effort by one side to get the other to quit. That's what's going to happen in Europe. Both sides begin, or both the British and the Americans would adopt firebombing. The British had already done it to a limited extent. One massive raid in 43 at Hamburg, and this is Hamburg right here. In one night, it a shocking or it shocked the German people to their core. 45,000 civilians died in Hamburg in one night. The problem was, oh, and this is, uh, in 45, they did this to Berlin in February of 45. Berlin is going to be just devastated. And that's before fighting, it, a house-to-house -house fighting when the, uh, the Soviets would take it in, at the end of April of 1945. Yeah, the German civilians would be crushed by this. It was devastating. But that actually made the Germans fight harder. The thing about the Germans fighting so hard is, first off, they know how bad they treated the Russians and know the Russians want revenge. But also, if the U.S. and British are willing to do this to civilians, how cruel might they be if they conquer Germany? But then, the biggest firebombing raid in Europe would happen in the end of February of 1945 in this town, a beautiful kind of medieval Baroque town called Dresden. Dresden had not been bombed before, or very little. And it was a refugee center. There were hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing the Soviets. So it's filled with people. So we don't know how many people were actually in Dresden, but over a thousand bombers bombed it. British bombers bombed in the night, and Americans came into the day, partially to, get, to knock out the fire crews, so the fires would rage. And they destroyed Dresden. And the thing about Dresden is, and this happened other places too, but this was the biggest up to that moment, what they call a firestorm. Some of you might have heard this term. So you'll fire, the first place would come in and they would drop heavy bombs, trying to create kind of rubble, um, like get buildings to kind of shatter and splinter, and then drop the incendiary bomb. White phosphorus and the brand new, developed by the DuPont Corporation, called napalm. You know what napalm is? It's got a gasoline and and what? Yeah, it burns and so it runs out of oxygen or fuel. Uh, um, gasoline, phosphorus, a couple of things. I'm not going to tell you how to make napalm. Somebody would find it. But they begin to bomb. They create a rubble, and then the bombers came with napalm in the center. And this started burning this fire. The fire got bigger as it spread and, and small fires growing together. And the thing is, fires require oxygen. So it started sucking in oxygen. As it sucked in oxygen, it got hotter and then sucked in more oxygen. And it would begin to kind of explode on itself, kind of in a big circuit and get even bigger. And it began to suck in oxygen so fast it basically creates its own weather pattern. And wind would start blowing, sucking into the fire over 100 miles an hour which would fuel over a thousand degree fires, got bigger, 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 until it literally ran out of fuel. They found thousands. So the Germans after it were going through the rubble. They found thousands of civilians who made it to shelters that weren't physically injured, except for the fact that they had asphyxiated because of the firestorm sucking the oxygen. Just thousands all sitting in these bomb shelters underground. They dug them out. They just found, so Dresden was destroyed. And when this, uh, after the war, they just kind of did a quick, hasty rebuild. So they started rebuilding again in the late 90s. They're still doing it right now. I was there in 2009, which is like one of the big constructions. So I'm trying to make it like it was before World War II. And five years ago, they found four families 
that had gone down to a shelter. They found them, and then they, they, were, they were asphyxiated, they got covered up by rubble, and no one found them until they were rebuilding. About 2000, I think it was 2009 or 2010. Just all mummified. Down there. And so, we don't know how many. When I was your age, the talk was like 80,000 people, maybe 90, maybe 100. We think it's closer to about 50,000, but we just don't know because of the refugees. But Dresden was a slaughter. There's something you need to know about Dresden that's really important, and it applies to your DBQ, let alone the reason they dropped the atomic bomb. Dresden was going to be in the Soviet occupation zone. The Soviets just beat the Germans. The Soviets look like a country that might not want to stop. We didn't realize how much they destroyed the war. They might not want to stop. How do you stop that army? Well, you know, you might have the most powerful land army, but look what we can do to a city. And you get to see it now. They talked about this. We're going to show the Soviets what we got. And they're hoping to end the war faster. Did it end the war faster? No, not really. But while this is going on, Germany in the final offensive would surrender May 8th. Like I told you, tomorrow I'll do some of that because I'll have to make sure I get this in. But against Japan, while this is going on in Europe, what do they call that operation where they would attack, like at first, uh, Guadalcanal, where they skip strong points? Japanese strong points, island hopping. And that's what they've been doing. So Guadalcanal, they just get to Bougainville. They call it leapfrogging where they advance across New Guinea. And soon these areas here in red, those have been surrounded by 1945, early 1944. They would attack and reconquer the Philippines. But the thing is, Japan, the men fought to the bitter end. Every island, casualties, Sometimes the casualties were not as high, but they were appallingly high still. And even though the Japanese army, in fact, here um, the army was running out of men and equipment, the carrier fleet was destroyed at a place called, a battle called the Philippine Sea. And they were basically militarily defeated by 45. In the biggest naval battle in history off of the Philippines, the Japanese attempt to stop that invasion was destroyed in a bloody battle that would pretty much wipe out the remnants of the Japanese fleet. And by 45, the U.S. was attacking Iwo Jima and Okinawa. On Iwo Jima, an island smaller than the Helena Valley, the Japanese had 22,000 defenders on this island that was basically a volcanic island, it's a volcano and ash. I guess it was still steamy in their fence. I guess the ash was about 110 degrees. Can you imagine fighting in that? And it's going to be extremely hot anyways on that island. 22,000. They fought for a month. Each tunnel or spider hole in the mountain, the volcano called Mount Suribachi, had to be rooted out one by one. All but 200 of those Japanese had to be killed. On the Philippines, they used for the first time. Yeah. What island was that again? Iwo Jima. And that's the one I told you had the you know, Iwo Jima. And, and the thing about it is, we're thinking, wow, how are they going to, or how long are they going to, uh, if we have to invade Japan, how are they going to fight? And they started first in the Philippines, but then they would use thousands of these at Okinawa. They were out of oil, out of fuel. They couldn't train pilots. And yet, they wanted to show the United States that look how we fight. Look how many we are going to kill. Make peace terms. Don't make us totally surrender. Give us peace terms. What was that weapon that they would use thousands at Okinawa? Using the code of Bushido, it was kamikaze. Now, actually, the Japanese called it cell bomb, but they gave it the term kamikaze because that was a typhoon that knocked out a Chinese invasion fleet on the way to China, or on the way to Japan 500 years ago. But what the kamikazes were, were pilots trained just enough to take off and steer their planes. And the idea was they would fly these into American planes. And this was terrifying. The American planes were rippling with anti-aircraft weapons. Or American fighter planes shot down almost all of them. 
but it's hard to find somebody who will not turn back <coughs> rationally, the idea being, okay, I'll turn back and fight another day. How do you fight a suicide bomb? Who's already said, I'm going to die. And they just kept coming. And so this would make it even more terrifying with the implication, how many more of these kamikazes might there be? And here is the USS Hancock, an American carrier that was hit by a kamikaze and nearly sunk. This was kept secret from the American public, but at Okinawa alone, over 39, well, outside of 39 American ships were sunk by kamikaze. This was a terrifying weapon. Now, why did they do it? Not to win the war. Remember what they're trying to do. Convince the Americans it's not worth it anymore. But also, what a complete act of desperation. What a complete act. So, as Japan gets pushed back, the United States also began bombing. Anybody know what plane that is? One of the most expensive armed programs in history. We spent $2 billion at that time. That's about $32 billion today just to develop that plane called the B-29. Super focus. It's only used in the Pacific. It could carry 12,000 pounds of bomb, 3,000 bodies. And it could fly 30,000 feet. It was pressurized. They thought above Japanese defenses. And they thought they could precision bomb Japanese targets from bases in Guam, Saipan, Tinian, right here, and start bombing Japan. And so they began to bomb. In fact, one of the things that Iwo Jima was, they could have fighter planes there. And they bombed Japanese cities. And it failed miserably. They couldn't hit anything at 30,000 feet. Japanese fighter planes, as it turned out, some could get that high and shot them down. And also, on the way this way, they discovered that they would always run into this headwind. 100 miles, 120 miles per hour. And you go into the headwind at 30,000 feet, their fuel would be used up and they had to turn around. They had no idea why there was this constant headwind that seemed to be going from east to west. Sometimes it'd be there, sometimes it would move. They had no idea what, what did they discover? The jet stream. They had no idea about the jet stream, which pretty much dictates our weather pattern. They didn't know that. And so it really messed up long range bombers. In fact, when they plot flights across the Pacific now today, they lay for the jet stream for obvious reasons. The Japanese knew about the jet stream, did you know that? And they used the jet stream to attack the United States. Another one of those see what we're willing to do. You may know what they did? Oh, that's those little parcels. Whoops, there's Curtis LeMay. They used the American general. Bomb, balloons. Hydrogen balloons would fly over the jet stream. They'd carry incendiary bombs. And the idea would be they'd release the hydrogen. They'd be timed to release hydrogen over the coast of the United States. Incendiary bombs would light the forest on fire, create massive forest fires. And maybe the US would even have to send troops home to fight the fires. Okay, that's kind of ridiculous of not understanding the way the forests are here, but someone as far as Michigan. And so they used it. Well, Curtis LeMay was in charge of the American Air Force in the Marianas, 21st Air Force. Veteran of, of Europe, a hard fighting general who, I don't know if you noticed, but he liked to smoke. And he had to make this work. Just a few weeks, a couple weeks after Dresden and a few weeks after Berlin, <laughs> what LeMay decided, what LeMay decided, we must do firebombing against Japan. High level bombing isn't working. And his crew really, re the crew is really resistant, but they took this plane that's supposed to go up 30,000 feet, they'll go down to 10,000 feet. They'll fly at night and they'll pack them full of white phosphorus and napalm bombs and drop them on Tokyo. There's fire bombs right there. Those are the heavy bombs, great rubble, and see all these little bombs? And the thing about it was, is many of these Japanese, especially in Tokyo, a little bit further south on the island, since the climate is so moderate, the walls in many of Japanese homes are wax paper. Wooden frame, wax paper, heavy roof, in case of typhoon. Can you imagine what wax paper would do? And they thought about this. So they bombed at night almost 500 planes the first time, March 9th and 10th of 1945, they hit Tokyo. This is looking back from a, a gun, uh, tail turret of a B-29, looking back at the first fire bombs hitting that town. Soon it would create the biggest firestorm ever seen up to that time, for sure. 
Here's Tokyo after that attack. Much of it was completely flattened. This is just some of the thousands of bodies burned or asphyxiated by the fire storm. So we don't know how many exactly were killed because they had refugee issues and various things, but it's anywhere from 100 to 120,000 people in one night. What happened to LeMay after killing that many civilians? Yeah, I got a promotion, got another star. And they began to firebomb every Japanese city. The only reason they didn't firebomb even more is they kept running out of bombs. They firebomb, run out of bombs, more bombs would arrive in the Marianas, firebomb more. And that's Osaka, which is the size of LA. Look at that after a firebombing attack. That's firebombing. We're going to jump right to this. Now, this is kind of hard to read, um, but it's all the Japanese cities, and the, the percentage next to it, that is the percentage of the city destroyed. I don't mean bombed or damaged, I mean gone. And then in parentheses, they put a comparable size US city next to it. I think it's a really effective idea to let you know what happened from March of 45 all the way through the very end of the war. Hey, they did not put firebomb just because they dropped to the top of the bombs. So for example, Tokyo is the size of New York City. So town of then almost 8 million people, 40% gone. So there's Nagoya. The size of LA, 40% gone. Osaka in LA is 3 million. Chicago, 2 million, 35.4% gone. They even have Tokyoama, the little factory there, but it's just they're running out of cities, so it bombed everyone. The size of Butte, so about 30,000, half of it gone. The town of Toyama, northern Japan, where they built fighter planes, 99% gone. They fire bomb everywhere. They killed hundreds of thousands of civilians. An unbelievable attack. And LeMay said, you let me keep firebombing, there'll be nothing left to win the war. But there's two things about this. First off, they didn't quit fighting. They still would not surrender after losing this many. Think about how they fought on the islands. Remember that? That's why I put on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, about Kamikaze. Think how they fought, and they still kept. They would not surrender, technically. Oh, I almost forgot. There is one city that's not on there for firebombing. It's a really big city. It's not on there for firebombing. It's there for another reason. Hiroshima. Hiroshima was not firebombed. That was one city that when they was ordered not firebombed. If we do decide to use a weapon that's being developed in Los Alamos, New Mexico, they want to see what that weapon does. So they don't want firebombing to happen, so they wouldn't know which caused what. So it says 48.5%, that was the atomic bomb. So, one more thing about this, and this is important to understand about dropping the atomic bomb. And I think it is much more complex about it, but think about 1945, we're trying to end this war. And the United States has already made the moral decision that civilians are not only targets, but killing Burning hundreds of thousands to death is perfectly legitimate in this war. How's that different than dropping an atomic bomb? We, no, we could actually, there is that big difference. But just think of 45. We've already decided we're going to kill 100,000 in one night. How's that different? How is that different? Is it? Actually, <laughs> you think about 400 bombers that killed all those people in Tokyo, and one plane did that in Hiroshima. Just imagine if you had 400 planes, each with an atomic bomb. That kind of changes the equation, doesn't it? But don't forget that. The Senate 45, they've already made this moral decision. But we're going to kill as many civilians as possible. What's the difference? So a better question is, did we need to do it to end the war? So, that's another map of that. That one didn't turn out as well. So, one more thing. American submarines. Submarines, not as highly publicized, not as exciting as aircraft carriers or battleships. The last bat clash of battleships was Leyte Gulf. But American submarines, by the end of 43, when we got torpedoes that actually kind of worked, the first ones didn't work, they hit ships and cross off. But, they began to first patrol here, but then surround Japan, 
Each dot, the bigger the dot, the greater number of Japanese merchant ships sunk. By the summer of 45, and get this down, submarines like that had destroyed virtually the entire Japanese merchant fleet. That means all their transports, all their freighters, all their tankers. There's a Japanese, that's a pretty good shot from an American periscope, from a submarine, American submarine's periscope, of a torpedo just hitting it and breaking the back of that ship. Remember how unrestricted submarine warfare in the U.S. kind of went to war over that, World War I? The U.S. adopted it. No mountains of sailors. But here's the big deal why that's so important. Remember, they took this so their tankers could carry the fuel. By the middle of 44, they could hardly get any tankers. And this is what we got to get. By July of 45, Japan had about a month and a half, month and a half of fuel reserves left. A month and a half. They had three months of food. There is absolutely no way, everyone get this, no way Japan could have kept fighting past December of 45. No way. I'm not saying they would have quit. I mean, Bushido, and remember they told you how they killed all their prime ministers, but they couldn't have kept fighting. So maybe there are more reasons that we're already firebombing cities. So, with that, a couple of the wartime conferences we got against. Casablanca. When the war was going on, there would be conferences that decided first how they're going to fight the war, and then the post war world. The first conference, and I forgot to put who is here, but write this down FDR and Roosevelt. I made a mistake on this. I was going to flash these two. It was going to be exciting, and I forgot to hit the. Uh, no, we just leave it. And what? They decided a couple different things. Oh, did I tell you the date? Uh, no, you didn't fix it. FDR and Roosevelt. Did I say FDR and Roosevelt? He's schizophrenic. And that was a problem with this. We had two presidents. We had many presidents. FDR and Truman. I like this picture. All the people here signed it. That'd be pretty cool to have. That would be pretty valuable. And Roosevelt and Churchill signed it. Truman? <laughs> Truman. No, I didn't. <laughs> Remember to go into the tape? <laughs> okay, let's act like we, we're starting over. At Casablanca, in the fall of 1943, Roosevelt and Churchill with me, Truman was just a senator from Missouri. Yeah. Casablanca was right here. By the way, it has nothing to do with one of the, it's considered the greatest or the second greatest movie ever made, <laughs> Dumb and Dumber. And with that, no, Casablanca. And does anyone see Casablanca? It is a fantastic movie. Last year we watched it after the test and after we finished that. And it was a fun thing. And it's, a, it's such a good movie. If you haven't seen it, you will like it. Or you will not graduate. No. Well, that one never was a little more sophisticated. Exactly. So with that, here at this conference, this is when this is actually the, the press conference outside of this meeting. Roosevelt announced that the United States and Britain will accept nothing but unconditional surrender from Italy, Japan, and and Germany. Unconditional surrender. Now, it's partially because we don't want another like thing like World War One, where Germany was not totally defeated. And we figure very legitimately, Nazi Germany has got to be totally defeated. But there's another thing. They're not talking so much to Hitler. Because they know Hitler's going to fight to the death. They're talking to Stalin. Stalin, they're terrified that Stalin might think the U.S. and Britain will never open that second front. By saying unconditional surrender, they're telling Stalin, <laughs> we promise to attack France. We promise. Don't you. Make a separate peace with Germany, like you made a peace back in 39. So they're trying to tell Stalin, even though they haven't fully committed, we promise we will. That's why he did it. Now, you look at that and think, okay, that's a political measure. There's a logic to it. The problem is, now we're stuck to unconditional surrender. It makes perfect sense against Nazi Germany. 
does it make sense against Japan? And this is Roosevelt's statement. What if the president at the end of the war isn't Roosevelt? Roosevelt will die in April of 1945. He'll have a brain aneurysm. His vice president now must follow on the legacy of Roosevelt, a.k.a. unconditional surrender. And why is Japan fighting now? What do they, what do they want? They want conditions. And in fact, by summer of 45, they're only going to have one condition. What? Keep the air. That's all they want. You want to hear that? That was in the reading I gave you. That's why I put down emperor right there. Keep the emperor. But that is a condition. Japanese cities are devastated. Their army is destroyed. They're out of food and water. They're resorted to suicide bombing. And yet they're not willing to unconditionally surrender. They want to keep the emperor. There might be more. So with that, big deal. So then at Tehran, the big three met. This is a month after Casablanca, 43. Truman, Attlee, and Adlai Stevenson, who was in the governor of Illinois, were not involved. But I just came up with three people off the top of my head. This is at Tehran. Stalin, Churchill, and FDR met. And basically what they said is they got blocked out a little bit. I'm sorry, but they said, we promise a second front. We're going to attack France which would be in June of 1944. Why did they do it then? Well, Churchill was still reluctant, but this is when Stalin said, he was been saying, attack, attack, attack. And then at Tehran, Stalin, puffing on his pipe, did one of these through a translator. You can delay the attack if you're not ready. <laughs> and they're all like, why did he say delay? You know why? What was that massive tank battle where they destroyed the And then Stalin's all of a sudden thinking, Maybe if they wait, we can get more. And that's when the U.S. and the British decided, we better get it now. Because who knows where Stalin will stop? Did you hear that? Who knows where he'll stop? And then, the last meeting of the Big Three would be in 1945 at Yalta. Yalta is a, that was a beautiful resort town in the Crimea. And... But then this area had been devastated by the war, and Stalin said, we're meeting here so you see what happened to my country. And there they're meeting. Look at church, and look at Roosevelt. His body was breaking down. He'd been president since 1933, the Depression and World War II, combined with his paralysis. He could no longer stand like he used to be able to. It's in a wheelchair there, but they always covered it with a shawl. You notice how so they couldn't see the wheels because that was seen as inappropriate. He was dying. He was no he's so sharp but noticeably more tired. And he would only have three months left to go. And so what they decided at Yalta were these things. Number one, Germany and Berlin would be divided up into occupation zones. Four of them. Now, Austria too, but we're not going to worry about that. Soviets, British, US, and French. They'd give the people. But also, inside the Soviet occupation zone, Berlin would be divided up into four occupation zones. And so you're going to have this, but the idea was someday then the four powers will come together and Germany will be reunified. That was the plan. Well, this is going to become East Germany. West Germany, and I was your age, West Berlin, East Berlin. I know what you're thinking, but I actually was your age after World War II. Close. And then they said the Soviets get reparations. They will get money from Germany. And this was a big deal for two ways. First off, Stalin said Germany's got to pay for destroying this. But at the same time, both Churchill and Roosevelt are reluctant for reparations, remembering how bad Germany was after World War I. But they promised reparations. And Stalin saw this as, I'm owed this. You guys slided me with the Second Front. You guys slided me at Munich or whatever it might be. I'm owed this. Next. Stalin promised 
elections in Eastern Europe, especially Poland. Remember, that's where the war started. He said he would allow go the government in exile to come back to Poland, and they would come up with a uh, some kind of coalition government, write a constitution. But he never really meant this. I think I have to pull it on that. Yeah, pull it. He always wanted this area to be a buffer zone between him and Germany. Germany is back in World War I, World War II. He's worried about World War III. And so there's no way that Stalin would ever allow governments. And I put it on Eastern Europe, but in reality it's Central Europe. But we always call this Eastern Europe. He would not allow governments there that weren't friendly, a.k.a. Stalinist dictatorship. <laughs> There's no way. And he thought Churchill and Roosevelt understood that. He thought this was just kind of talk. Next. They created the United Nations. This would replace what body didn't work after World War I? But this time, remember Article 10? Remember the whole thing? You guys did a DBQ on it. About collective security, it would solve that by saying, all big decisions will be decided not in the General Assembly of countries, but in a security council at 11, and eventually now it has 15 members. But there'll be five permanent members, and each member will have a veto. And therefore, more conservatives in both the United States or United States and other countries, they could stop anything they don't want. Now, what are the five permanent mem members? You can guess you're the big three US, Soviets, and Britain, but then who else? China and France. Yeah, China and France. And even though China was not necessarily a great power because they were in the middle of civil war, the U.S. wanted China to become kind of a stabilizing force there. But if five countries have a veto for every important decision, that means one country can stop anything. That means what happens in the U.N.? Yeah, can't get anything done because of this. Has everyone got that? The U.N. is an important body if you believe in diplomacy, if you believe that it's good to come together and talk. But at the same time, it has no power. It's, it, it, in a way, it was a broken promise. And then, FDR is still worried about Japan. Japan, they thought, had 2 million men in China and Manchuria. And so the Soviets pledged they would attack Japan three months after VE Day. VE Day is victory in Europe. That's when Germany surrenders. That's just what happened to be May 8, 1945. And they promised them islands. If you look up here real quick where I'm at, all of this islands, some islands here, maybe something in Manchuria. But we all know if Soviets attack here, they're going to ask for more than just what happened. They're going to ask for more. And so with that, the Alta Agreement was seen as success as first. But as the years went by, I'm sorry, the years, the months. And Stalin never allowed free elections. And yet now he occupies part of Berlin, and he is going to become a major power in Asia, Manchuria, China, and maybe even take part of Japan. More and more people started, more conservatives started to occur in Yalta, saying it was another Munich, which is synonymous with. Uh, and they'll talk about Yalta, Yalta, Yalta all the time, that they were fooled. And here's the thing about this. In January, they weren't sure. By May, Japan was about ready to surrender. By July, it was certain. Soon, May, what day did the Soviet Union Stalin, usually, surprisingly, oftentimes kept his promises. He did attack Japan. By the way, Japan had no idea. They were really shocked. What day? What day? August 8th. They attacked three months after. What day did the United States drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima? The sixth. Two days before. We better get this war over before the Soviets come in. Remember, we're already firebombing cities. They're almost out of fuel. We know that. There'll be one more thing I'll have to tell you. And then the last agreement. Oh, yeah, we'll get to Potsdam. But Potsdam's a lot different. 
toss them right outside of Berlin. You can go to this place. It's, it's pretty cool. And in it, now we have Stalin, and then we have Truman, the surprise choice to be FDR's last vice president, who is totally misinformed about what's going on. Churchill, and here they are right here, arrived for the first day of Potsdam, but then he had to go back because he had the first elections in Britain since war began, and he was replaced with the labor leader, Clement Attlee. Now, Attlee was part of Churchill's government, knew everything that's going on. But so you can imagine how Stalin came in. He was the victor. He won World War II. He strutted around. He boasted. He bragged. He was the big shot. Infuriated Truman, who had to think about trying to look tough. And he looked at these two and thought, Churchill and Roosevelt were titans. Atlee and Truman? And Potsdam was a big deal. First off. Britain and, France, Britain and the United States would issue the Potsdam Declaration, telling Japan to surrender or what will happen to them. Yeah. Total and utter annihilation. They will be destroyed. But what would, how would you take that if you were Japan? What's already happening to your cities? Yeah. So what does that mean? They, in essence, said, we'll reconsider this later. The Americans took that as a snub. Next. About those free elections, Stalin informed Truman, you know, we're not going to have free elections. And there's nothing you can do about it. And Truman was furious. And so Attlee and Truman told him, ah, uh, no reparations. And Stalin was furious. And you could argue this is the beginning of the Cold War. Oh, one more thing. Truman was born, I meant to put is born, the baby inborn. Truman was born by cold, the baby is born. As we all know, we're overjoyed when the baby was born. In fact, in joy, he ran over to Stalin and said, the baby is born. No, what did he tell Stalin? The baby born was code for Trinity. Trinity was the code name for the test of the atomic bomb, and it worked. While they were in Potsdam, it worked. And Truman went to Stalin, overjoyed because Stalin strutting around. And Truman's like, I'll show you. I have a bomb that can destroy a city. One bomb. And he expected Truman or Stalin to be. And what did Truman and what did Stalin do? Puff on his pipe and said, Good, I hope you use it against the Japanese. Truman was so disappointed. Why did Stalin know? He had spies. And so there'll be a couple of things left that I'll either give it to the seven to make sure you have, or I'm here, I'll tell you tomorrow sound good. The DBQ will be on Thursday. Make sure you go through just one more time. All right, DBQ. I really want you to have fun with it. Hey, DB, hey, we got to write that. Hey, at least give you a document. Don't forget that. Yeah. What's that? Stalin was kind of an not him, not his action, but his personality. Stalin is a weird man. <laughs> Stalin is still the most popular leader the Soviets will ever have. Number two is Ivan the Terrible. What about Peter the Great? Drift to say hi to the camera. 